Our gospel lesson comes from Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. Hear the word of God. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the lake. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly. My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher anymore? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, John, and the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but asleep. And they laughed at him. Then they put them them outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the little girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overwhelmed and amazed. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the word of the Lord. There's an old Peanuts cartoon that I like that has Charlie Brown at Lucy's psychiatric booth. You know, the one with the big banner, psychiatric help, five cents. After Lucy dispenses one of her typically twisted diagnoses, Charlie Brown is left sitting there head in hand, with a forlorn look on his face. He implores the cosmos, where do I go to give up? (coughs) Where do I go to give up? It's a question many others have asked. Maybe even us. We've tried everything and find ourselves at the end of our rope, 
Nothing seems to help. Problems loom ominously on, on every side, and they seem so insurmountable. Where do I go to give up? It's very much the question being asked by the author of Psalm 130, and must have been on the lips of the woman whose life had been bleeding away for 12 years. Psalm 130 is a plea for help, specifically a cry for a divine hearing. It's one of the best-known pieces of liturgical prayer. The psalm opens with a cry, from the depths, using a Hebrew verb meaning to be deep. The word has both a literal meaning, the depths of the sea, and also figurative, referring to emotional, psychological, spiritual distress. Unlike our contemporary understanding of life and death, the writer of biblical poetry, especially in the Psalms, perceives the relationship to God and life to be relative rather than absolute. One could be more or less in the divine presence and life, or one could be more or less away from it, in death, or Sheol, or the pit, or depths. They're used pretty much interchangeably. To be gravely ill, for instance, was often perceived as having been dragged into the vestibule of death. One wasn't simply near death. One was actually in it. And it was from that frightening and lonely and unhappy location that one cried out to God for deliverance, as does the author of today's psalm. Yet while crying out to God to hear his plea, the psalmist at the same time expresses confidence that God has the power to redeem and even encourages the whole community to place its hope and trust in the Lord. Verse 6 especially so shows how desperately the psalmist looks for the Lord's merciful response. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. We can imagine a person who has many troubles making that person's world a place of darkness and despair. All that person has left is the possibility that the hard times will eventually pass, and that morning, a new day, a new dawn, a new beginning, will come. The person is waiting, waiting for restoration. In the middle of our gospel lesson, a woman is waiting in the vestibule of death, waiting 12 long years for restoration. She waits with the darkness of utter powerlessness, covering her like a shroud. The strength and power of life has slowly drained out of her. She lives in a perpetual state of anemia. She is physically spent. Any ac economic power that she might have had is long since gone. Spent on quacks and purveyors of false hope. As a first century woman, she had only a small measure of power. But as a woman who was branded unclean, she was to totally stripped of any standing, subjected to the powerless life of an outcast. She lived in the darkness, in the vestibule, on the shadowy edges of community. 
in this dark and powerless place, I see this woman reaching down into the only reservoir that was not drained empty, the reservoir of faith. I hear her sing in a dry and feeble voice. Over and over she chants. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. Out of the depths I cry. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. Hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him great power to redeem. I cry with a faint song in her heart. She peers out of the vestibule of death. She sees the psalm's fulfillment, the robe of the Redeemer, Pass by. With an empty rest- reservoir of strength and a renewed reservoir of faith, she pushes through a tremendous crowd, comes up behind Jesus, and touches his garment. Instantly, the bleeding ceases. She feels in her body that she has been healed. She is aware that power has gone forth from him. He quickly asks, Who touched my garments? The disciples are amazed, almost amused. You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? But he keeps looking around, keeps looking, until the woman comes in fear and trembling and tells him the whole truth. And Jesus explains to her what has happened. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. After 12 long years of waiting and hoping, the morning has come. Dawn has come, dispelling the darkness of night. A new day has come, a day of wellness and peace. The woman moves out into the community with restored power and vibrant faith. The new day emerged out of the darkness with much more than the dawning of a cure for this woman. In the midst of the darkness, wellness, restoration, shalom, wholeness, shines forth. The the woman experienced much more than a simple cure from bleeding. What the woman received was restored restoration of power. She was made whole and moved out of the darkness of isolation and exile back into the community under the power of the peace and wholeness of the Redeemer. Restoration came to this woman in all of its fullness. She was restored physically, emotionally, societally. The one who was totally drained, whose cup was empty, was filled with the peace of the Redeemer. Jesus emptied himself, drained out his power, that the song of faith would be realized in this person. There's another song of faith in the letter to the Philippians that describes the cross of restoration that Jesus brings. Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Psalm 130 sings out the faith that God is steadfast in love 
and that God will redeem and restore. The woman in the gospel lesson shows a life that is lived out grounded in the truth of the psalm. And the gospel lesson shows the depth that God will go in Jesus to bring redemption and restoration. One of my many joys, and there were many, many joys, when I went on the footsteps of faith earlier this month, was seeing the newly restored frescoes in the Sistine Chapel. The process of restoration spoke to me as I thought about our scripture lessons. Restoring a damaged work of art is a tricky process. When the frescoes of the Sistine Chapel were were restored, the technicians didn't wash or scrub, scrape or peel. Instead, they unleashed a flood of microorganisms that cheerfully ate away the gunk and grime, revealing the patina beneath. Workers then washed the microorganisms away to expose the restored painting, and thus an agent of restoration dies in order to accomplish the work of restoration. Hmm. An agent dying to render others clean and whole. Obviously, one dying in order to restore others is a New Testament theme, but restoration is a song in both Testaments. Thus, the writer of Psalm 130 declares, For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its inequities. Well, sure, ancient Israel needed redemption. Israel, whose citizens, and especially whose leaders, seemed often to turn away from the covenant God had made with them, had a deep need to return to a state of wholeness, to return to the covenant before the Lord. The Old Testament is full of that story. But we, too, have need for restoration. We have only to consider what the word implies, that something has deteriorated from its original condition, to see our need for restoration. So what has deteriorated in your life? Your health, your marriage, your friendships, your reliability, your hopes and dreams, your faith, your sense of peace, your confidence, your resolve to live a faithful life. Anytime we say something like, my, you fill in the blank, isn't what it used to be, we're identifying an aspect in our lives where restoration would be welcome. The Bible tells of restoration taking place in single areas of life, But the Bible gives examples of a broader restoration. The woman in our lesson is an example of a broad restoration. When we think about restoration in our own lives, it's important to see that the Bible is not talking about putting something back in its exact original condition. If we were anxious and unsettled, we might wish that we had the sense of peace we had as a little child, and that, we could, that it could be restored and we, we could return to that child time. But the peace then may have been because of our outlook was mostly uninformed about the world. Do we now really want to return to our childhood? Likewise, if it's our faith that we'd like to have made whole, We certainly don't want to return to the blind certainty we may have had once that made us suspicious or intolerant of people who didn't understand the Bible exactly the same way as we did. Fortunately, that kind of restoration is not what the Bible 
is talking about. A good way to understand biblical restoration is by analogy with property restoration. Dwight Young, for many years, was an officer with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. He writes about coming upon a preservation revitalization project that, he, as he saw it, had gone too far. Actually, it was impressive, he declared, to see a row of old buildings gleaming like new after decades of neglect. Brickwork was freshly scrubbed, woodwork freshly painted, signs advertising cheery apartments on the upper floor. At street level, some of the storefronts were already occupied, while others were decked with open soon banners that promised a plenitude of iPods and designer shoes. It all looked bright and hopeful and disturbingly brand new. Young went on to say that such preservation misses the basic concept. Instead of just doing what's needed to keep the building's integrity, stability, and youthfulness, we're all too eager to slam it with the architectural equivalent of a, as, of a face peel, a tummy tuck, a hefty, hefty dose of Botox. The beauty of an old building, Young explains, is that it's old and stripping away all evidence of its age is disrespectful. We pause here to note that the restoration work on the frescoes in the Sistine Chapel is not aimed at making them look like they did the day the artist completed them. Rather, it is to remove grime, repair damage, and stabilize them so that their inherent beauty and message, and even their age, can be seen and speak to today's viewers. And this brings us back to that word, patina. Young reminds us that patina, the sheen produced by age and use, is a highly desirable commodity, not just in Chippendale chairs, but also in buildings, and also, we would add, in Christians. God's promise of restoration is not to return us to a state of naivete or unthinking discipleship or easy but ultimately inadequate solutions. Neither is it a spiritual tummy tuck merely lopping off the useless weight we carry in our souls because we find them, fill them with things that don't properly nourish us. Rather, when we seek restoration from God, he grants us wholeness where the beauty of our scars, the wisdom of our struggles, and the empathy from the dark valleys we've walked enable us to live in deeper peace and gratitude and to confront life as it is with hope. That kind of restoration is what the psalmist in the 130th Psalm hoped for. It's the kind of restoration that the psalmist proclaims in Psalm 51. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. Willing spirit, that's patina. That's sheen and luster. It's the sheen and the luster of the woman in the gospel. Like the woman, we want to be Christians with a willing and faithful spirit, with sheen, with luster. That's who we're called to be. Amen.